Welcome to the Ghostman Radio Show, and I'm talking to Susan Sloped, who probably says that that's a mispronounced, because as she's mentioned to me, sometimes it's mispronounced, but hey, that's life, the universe and everything. It's an uh, author of 21 published books, including 17 adult books, fiction and non-fiction, three mainstream adult novels, Forward to Camelot, co-authored with Kevin Finn, Stealing Me, first published in 2013 and republished last year, under her own publishing imprint, Realising You, which he reinvented in Eugene, the self-help novel. Forward to Camelot was first published in 2003, was republished in 2013, was at number six in the Amazon bestseller top took honours in free literary competition as an option for a film production by a Hollywood company coming out soon. Stilly Fire is an off-the-world love story as named a semi-finalist in the 2008 Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award. Contest and a publication book came a hot new release in Amazon while shooting into the number two spot right away and being honoured in the Women's Fiction Chronicle of 2014 Feeder's favourite book awards. I feel like I'm reading the top chart the, the, the 20 and then number one <laughs> she contributed to the Chicken Soup of the Soul for America released after 9-11 a dealing with stories about survivors. She has also written and directed two or one act plays in the world premiere performances option two works for the screen and done sports reporting from Dodger Stadium that's baseball to us people in America, over here in the UK or what we used to call rounders <laughs> it's listed as multiple volumes of who's who in America who's who's in entertainment has been named a lifetime honorary <sighs> after I've said all that I'm knocking myself out <laughs> Susan how are you I do. It's part of the. If it's a bio, I read it. Now let's go book by book, shall we? Now, obviously, I, I think one of your most favourite books we've done, and you, I, I know you've done a lot of historical um, work into it. And though it's a fiction, there's a lot of history behind it. And I like the concept of time travel as well, because I've written a book about time travel, and it's called Forward to Camelot. It is one of my favorites. It's, it's, um, I'm, it's a book I'm extremely proud of because uh, we managed to get a lot of actually very real history into it that nobody had ever learned about before. There's a lot of stuff in there that uh, no one has ever had the chance to find out, and we did a lot of digging in our research. And what we found was the stuff we were able to use to actually shape and sculpture the book, and we were very proud of that. And, and did you find that writing the book quite interesting? Oh, yeah. It cannot work as hard as we did, as long as we did, to write a book like this and take as long as it took us, which is, you know, more than five years, really, without being passionate about your subject. I mean, extremely passionate about it, because we kept reading and watching stuff and learning new stuff and going to conventions and talking to people and everything else. And only after we had done that and begun to put the story together did we actually sit down to write it. Because I like the little burb you got. You got on November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, just hours after President Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president aboard Air Force One using JFK's own Bible. Immediately afterwards, the Bible disappeared. It's never been recovered. Today, its value would be beyond price. In the year two thousand, actress Katie Cutler, Kyler, Kyler, sorry, it was called to turn to the nineteen sixty three for this Bible, also discovering why her father disappeared in the same city on a, on the tragic same tragic day, finding frightening links between them will lead Katie to a far more perilous mission to somehow prevent the president's murder with a mo- uh, one unlikely ally, ally an ex-marine called Lee Harvey Oswald. Which I like. I like the fact you've actually almost got Lee Hod- Harvey Oswald as a, a sort of anti-hero. Actually, in a strange way, he is the hero of this novel. Um, and this is going to sound weird to you, Mark, but you know what? In the process of doing the research, we began to get very clear about the fact that no matter what else he did or did not do, he did not kill the president. 
and I will argue that with anybody, anytime, and I've got a lot of stuff on my side to talk about, because the main thing really is, is that it was extremely clear almost from the very beginning. They couldn't possibly have actually done this. They also had a lot of, turned this up in research, he had a lot of qualities that were genuinely wonderful qualities. He was a tremendous patriot, he loved his country, he wanted to serve his country with belief in his president, and all of that stuff makes for a very large difference when you're talking about a situation where um, somebody is being set up for something that should not have actually happened in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's funny how he's always portrayed as the ultimate bad guy in America, obviously. not. Uh, this is absolutely true. And it, what's interesting is I have two things I can tell you about that. Because I'm sure somebody in your audience will believe that Oswald actually killed the president. They're not willing to do anything else. Let me tell you two very quick stories that I think are going to make a very large difference. Um, on the day, at the very moment that Kennedy was shot, Dallas police swarmed the Texas School Book Depository, which was that tall building on the corner of Houston and Elm Street, which is where they believed the shots were coming from. And, of course, they ran in there, and they never really ran out. They basically spent a lot of time taking measurements and information and fingerprints and all kinds of other stuff on the sixth floor of the School Book Depository, right? And that night, they sent all of the fingerprints that they had collected to the FBI lab in Washington, which at the time was considered the best fingerprint lab in the world. Okay. Now what happened was three sets of different prints emerged from that. One was the set of prints that came from people who actually worked in the Texas School Book Depository. These would be people you would expect their fingerprints to be actually up there because they were there all the time, right? And um, of those, Lee Harvey Oswald was actually a um, employee of the School Book Depository, so his fingerprints counted in there. The second group of people were men who had come in that week to lay flooring on the sixth floor of the school depository. They were putting in new flooring there, and so their fingerprints were all over everything, too. And there was a third set of prints that did not match either the men who were laying the flooring or the employees at the school depository. And it turned out this was just one set of prints, and uh, it belonged to a man named Malcolm Wallace, or Mac Wallace. Now, Mac Wallace, in case you're wondering, Mac Wallace was Lyndon Johnson's personal hitman. Whenever he needed somebody rubbed out on the way up on his political career, that is who he went to. He would go to Mac Wallace, and Mac Wallace would make sure that they died. And his fingerprints were, on the, the, uh, were in the school book depository on the sixth floor. So he was, ipso facto, in the school book depository on the sixth floor, which I find very interesting. Second little anecdote. Two weeks before the assassination, uh, Kennedy was scheduled to go to Chicago, and he was supposed to appear in a motorcade in Chicago. And an FBI informant basically told the FBI and got in touch with the Secret Service and said, you cannot let him come to Chicago because there is a shooter with a high-powered rifle who's going to be stationed in a tall building on the motorcade route. And so the motorcade went on. Kennedy did not, in fact, come to Chicago. Guess who? Guess who the informant was? The person you just mentioned? Yeah, the informant was Lee Harvey Oswald. Ah! Isn't that amazing? Well, yeah, it's, uh, all these little facts are get hidden, isn't it? Well, the point is they didn't really get in the book because we didn't learn them until after the book was published. <coughs> that part of it is not the fascinating part. The fascinating part is is that those two anecdotes should let anybody know who is listening that they need to look closer at this whole historical period because if you have a guy who is an FBI informant who stopped Kennedy from being shot by a high-powered rifle by another shooter in Chicago, then why would that same informant then be up there with a high-powered rifle on the sixth floor of the school repository trying to kill him? That makes no sense whatsoever. So... Um, that's only part of what we actually learned. Part of the other stuff we learned had to do with other things. One of the things that we found fascinating, and nobody has ever used this ever in a fictional story before, but um, I'm sure you know that elections, American elections, 1960 are way different than the, the latest elections that we've been through. I mean, I'm sure you know that, right? That's yeah, yeah. One of the things that was very important in 1960 
was that any man who was running for president would have to appear to be extremely healthy. Because uh, we had already had uh, Franklin Roosevelt as president, who was actually in a wheelchair from having gotten polio. And that was not considered So Kennedy, Kennedy energetic and healthy as anybody you might imagine. And he looked like it a lot of the time. However, what's interesting is Kennedy was an extraordinarily unhealthy man. Extremely unhealthy. Not only did he have a lot of sexually transmitted diseases, which given his habits is not surprising, but he also had a uh, sort of deafness in, his, in one of his ears. He had all kinds of issues with his back, which you probably already know about. But he also had Addison's disease. And Addison's disease, which was not diagnosed in him until the end of World War II, um, is a failure of the adrenal gland, which is very often almost fatal. And what happened was his doctors had developed kind of a cocktail of medications that they gave him every day that he had to have and that he was never without. And um, one of the things that we learned in the process of doing this research is that Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, who desperately wanted his son to be president, um, was so worried that Jack would someday be without his medications and have to go to a hospital to get them. He decided to go past all of these people and he stashed these medications in bank vaults, safe deposit boxes, all over the country so that anywhere that Jack might travel within the U.S., he might suddenly need his medications, he could go to a bank and get them. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. I, 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 like, I also like the fact that because you put it, the concept of it time travel in it, you could bring it up more because obviously you, the, the character is in that time. This is absolutely true. You're right. When you're, have, when you're dealing with time travel, time travel is a concept that allows you to go very, very deeply into things that most people never get into. And we loved that part of it. We loved it. We used it. This is also the first time I've ever heard of, and we did use this, that we had people time travel through the Internet. It had never been done before, obviously, because many books that were published beforehand, you know, the Internet did not exist. And now we're kind of looking at the thing and going, oh, yeah, this works really well. So we're having them time travel of having our actress, Katie, time travel to the internet, and therefore she's able to actually, um, she's able to actually reach that time where apparently she, her person who's helping her to do this has cameras stationed all over Dealey Plaza, and that's where she ends up. When she originally time traveled, she actually ends up in Dealey Plaza on the grass, right by the grassy knoll, uh, and this is before uh, November 22nd, so nothing has become famous about it or anything. But it's, it's an opportunity for us to kind of introduce her in a place that will become famous that everybody's going to know about. That's exciting for us. Hmm. I'm just looking at your... Um, uh, 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 what am I looking at? Da, 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 I don't know what I'm looking at in a minute. Da, 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 the fire one. The stealing fire. I'm looking at yeah, the... Fire. I'm looking at the prologue. And the first bit goes something along like, Autumn 1963, a mother liked to sing show tunes to her, putting on old records on her, old, on her battered record player and singing along with tinny recorded sounds of Broadway orchestras. She wanted to be a singer on a musical stage, her mother but settled for marriage and children for the first time it was offered and spent the rest of her life donning unhappily to her daughters about the opportunities she missed. And that's a little bit of a gift to people. And obviously they'll have to go and buy the book to find out more. So roughly what is the, the premise of this book? Stealing Fire is completely different. And on some level it's, it's extremely personal. Because many, many, many years ago I fell in love with a guy who was way older than I was. I was 25 and he was 60. And I know that's weird. I know it. But um, what happened was it developed into a really passionate relationship. And eventually, I was kind of struggling to try to understand what was actually happening because it turned into a very unhappy relationship. And um, 
because I didn't understand what was going on, you know, when you're that young, there's a lot of stuff you don't understand. I sat down one night at the typewriter, and don't laugh because that's what it was at the time. It was the 1980s, and that's what I had as a typewriter. And I sat down at the typewriter, and I started typing. And what was happening was is that this story was starting to come out. And it was really about me and this guy. As I kept writing and writing, it developed into two other characters, people who have basically different personalities and different things that are important to them. And so in Stealing Fire, the story is about a young girl who wants to sing on the Broadway stage. It's the 1980s. Uh, but, and the thing is, the 1980s is, is that in the 1980s, biggest splash was being made by Andrew Lloyd Webber, who I'm sure you know, who um, wrote a lot of very, very flashy um, productions for Broadway, like Cats and Starlight Express and Phantom of the Opera, uh, that didn't have a lot of plot, had a lot of, you know, a lot of production value. This is um, something that this girl doesn't completely understand. At the same time, there is a guy that is... Um, a song lyricist who used to write for Broadway and who was looking to get one more hit before he dies. And he's just about to turn 60. And he's writing um, commercial jingles to kind of stay alive. He wants one more shot. But the problem, again, is Andrew Lloyd Webber. You have somebody like that whose entire musical you know, thing is bound up in all this production value. It's extremely hard to find somebody who is different, who is going to actually be able to create bring something to Broadway that is going to, uh, they're willing to mount. So, um, he's a lyricist, she's a singer. They start talking actually over the phone, over the switchboard of a uh, hotel in New York where he stays when he comes to town for meetings. And uh, she's the one who answers the phone in the middle of the night. They end up starting to talk, they end up starting to flirt with each other. Uh, the first time they meet, it's absolutely explosive, they fall in love and the rest of the story is about how that love story plays out. I imagine it was quite um, cathartic re, um, doing that book. On some level, it was. It's What's interesting to me is, is that if I had to pick a book that I felt was the best written of everything I've ever done, that would be it. I think that's the best written book I've ever done. And um, I actually got a chance to reunite with the man that I'd been in love with all those years ago. Um some years ago, this would have been like 2004, and um, I told him that I was writing a book about, you know, our relationship, and I sent him what I had, which at that point was a lot of pages that were not really connected, and he wrote me back a letter, and I'll never forget it. He told me that where this story was concerned, he could not find an interesting plot or character. And well. I thought that was really fascinating, which gives you an idea of what kind of person he really was. So. It's funny when you write something more personal, how you put all you, a lot of you in it. Because I write stuff, and I sometimes when I re read it back, I think, oh God, I was a bit more personal than I thought. Yeah? <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's, it's almost impossible when you're writing not to put something of yourself into it, mostly because virtually everything that you know is based on your own experience. And what I've realized is that the girl, uh, Amanda, who is the heroine of Stealing Fire, <clears throat> me at a much younger age, and Katie Kyler, who's the actress from Forward Camelot, um, is me at a much older age. I mean, they're really virtually identical in terms of the kind of people that they are, what they want, and what they care about. So it's kind of like, you know what? I'm going to just keep doing it because people seem to like it. As long as they're reading it, I'm going to write it. So I'm just going to stick with it. I think one of the, I think one of your most aspiring books that you helped to contribute to is the Chicken Soup for the Soul of America. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. That was um, that was actually not written for Chicken Soup for the Soul. It was, what actually happened was there was a. Um, I don't know if it still exists, but there was a, a website. This is back in, this would have been around 1998, 1999, 2000, about the time I first got online. And it was called Heroic Stories. And the whole idea was is that you could submit something that you thought had some heroic qualities in it. And if they liked it, they would publish it. There you are. And so when 9-11 happened, I was still getting stuff from, from Heroic Stories. 
that was still, you know, they, what they were really trying to do was put out stuff that they felt was positive and uplifting and inspiring. And so I wrote this uh, about my experience and, and particular um, entry that I had in Chicken Soup for the Soul of America was really about my experience with my husband and my children. We went to um, the Red Cross the day after 9-11, because of course, as you remember, they said, oh, please give blood because there's going to be a lot of survivors, we're going to do a lot of different you know, things, please do that. So everybody all over America was going there, right? And we stood in line for eight hours. I mean, eight hours. And they brought out um, TV monitors, and they hooked them up so we could see what was going on in New York and Washington. And they brought us food all day long. I mean, I don't think I've ever eaten so much in my life as that particular day. And uh, we waited a really, really, really long time. And what we discovered was that the people who were in line with us were having fun. They, were, they wanted to help people, and the tragedy was being felt by all of us. But they wanted to have a good time. And they wanted to be who they were, which is basically Americans who care about, you know, what happens to other Americans. And, um, and this little P.S. there, we waited in line for eight hours, and when I finally, finally got to the head of the line, and they took a little sample just to make sure that I had enough iron in my blood, they decided I didn't have enough iron, so I wasn't allowed to give blood anyway. How about that? <laughs> I, I know, go ahead and laugh. And I have one of the rarest blood types in the world, so I have AB positive blood. So you would think they would have been, you know, and I said to them, listen, if I do this and you take this blood and it affects anybody, is it going to affect me or is it going to affect the person who gets my blood? And they said, it's going to affect you. And I said, here, take it. And they're like, nope, we won't do it. We can't. So eight hours in line, so I literally, so I could not donate blood. And I've never actually been able to donate blood since that time. Um, so that's what my chicken soup of the soul entry was actually about, was, was that period of time when people were coming together and if you remember back to 9-11 for a very short period right afterwards, there was just an unbelievable amount of unity especially in our country, this tremendous, tremendous uh, pulling together, everybody on the same page, everybody willing to get out there and do things and um, it didn't last all that long but it was just a tremendous thing, it really was and that was really what I'll, I'll mention something a bit more controversial now. But as you've mentioned, um, 9/11, there were lots of um, conspiracy theories about 9/11 as well. Yes, I know. I know. And and if you want to hear something interesting about that, I can pretty much find a conspiracy in anything. Just to let you know, we can we can have a conversation at some point if you're interested about um, my feelings about the Paul McCartney conspiracy. I found one in Titanic. I always talk about that, but as far as the 9-11 conspiracy was concerned, I was actually looking at another video on YouTube, and I think you know how it works on YouTube, which is that when you finish a video, if you don't immediately go to something else, it will pull up another video for you. But I was looking at some research materials on YouTube, and it stopped, and then the next thing that pulled up happened to be a uh, video about the 9-11 conspiracy, which I had never seriously looked into. This is about 2015 that I was doing this. And uh, I started looking at it. This, the entire thing, was, what's fascinating is it, it started with a guy talking about how he had started to get into this whole thing and how he was so distressed by what he learned that he had it was affecting his marriage, it was affecting his family, it was affecting the business they were planning to start. He literally could not stop being drawn into this, and it was hurting him so much. And I remember thinking, well, listen, I've already gone down the rabbit hole with Kennedy. You no, know, once you've done that and you've kind of understood how much evil is really out there, it's not that you know horrifying to go through it again. So I watched this video, and it dealt specifically with the fact that um, the towers could not have come down the way they did um, unless it was through controlled demolition, which I'm sure is the theory you've already heard. And... Um, I started looking at this, and I thought, you know what? Everything about this makes total sense to me. It really does. And so I took it to my ex-husband. At this time, he was my ex-husband. And I said, listen, you have an engineering degree, and I don't. I don't understand anything about this except that it makes sense to me, common sense-wise. So would you look at this and tell me where I'm wrong? Tell me what, you know, what's wrong about this that and just makes it ridiculous. And he looked at it. And by the way, I should also tell you that I met my husband's slave. I was at a JFK convention in Chicago. 
So we actually met talking about, you know, blood brains and autopsy photographs. That should give you a clue. But anyway, the point is that he looked at it, he got completely hooked. So watching videos and listening to stuff and reading stuff and whatever. And he went through this for probably about six months, just really, really involved with all this stuff. And it's extremely clear to both of us by now that everything that's gone on with 9-11 is, has been, we've been lied to. This was specifically done to try to get us into a frame of mind where we were willing to go to war, and this was the entire purpose of it. Am I upsetting you here, Mark? I hope not. No, I, I, I think there is a lot of fruition behind it. I mean, I have to say, I, 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 I'm glad that you were willing to talk about it, because some people, I, I know, wouldn't. So that's why I no, sort no. of cautiously brought it up, but because but, I know you are talking about uh, Kennedy before, I thought, well, you wouldn't mind. And I think it's just fascinating to put it out there. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not saying, oh, God, you know, you know, you know, but at the end of the day, if it, there's facts out there for people to find out. There's tons of them, and, and it's horrifying to think about. Some of the stuff that I learned just about 9-11 that's really interesting is the fact that it appears, it, apparently they said, and this is very interesting, they have already went into this, are you aware that at that time, uh, the ability for people to make cell phone calls from an airplane was extraordinarily limited. Are you aware of this? Yes, it was not like today's technology. No, it's not at all. And what's interesting is that at that particular time, if you flew past a specific cell tower, the call would drop. And so what was really happening was the people who were supposedly calling from the planes, calling and having extended conversations with people at times when they would have been flying past cell towers which should have cut them off altogether. And they were still managing to get these calls out, which I find extremely interesting. Also, there was one woman my ex told me about um, who actually had made a call to somebody, you know, and she left a voice message on a cell, on a um, voicemail machine because whoever it was was not picking up. And she said something about, you know, I love you and that plane's been hijacked and blah, 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 blah. And the very end, the last thing she said before she hung up was, it's a fake. So, take that for what it's worth. Also, the fact that, I mean, don't you find it a little odd that the entire building, uh, the Twin Towers literally go up in flames and, and crash into nothing, and somehow blocks away, they find pristine passports of the 9-11 hijackers? I mean, nothing burned, nothing ruined, in perfect, perfect, perfect condition. How do you even begin to explain something like that? You just don't, do you? I mean, at the time, it looked, it didn't look real. We did feel like I was watching a Hollywood film. Well, I, I hope, in fact, that that was your response because it, it's it was the most horrifying thing I ever lived through, and I don't remember ever crying as much in my life as I did that entire week. It was just heartbreaking. Absolutely hard. Oh, yes. I, I, I feel sorry for the people that went through it. I mean, there were some heroes that day. You mean, that bloke who stayed behind and made sure everybody was got out safe and all the firemen that went in and out and all the uh, well I, well you know more about it than I do and I, I just find the whole thing fascinating and I I, I, I I don't know about the um what the feeling is about the um memorial that's been set up for it I know there was a lot of controversy when they were making it but one of the things that has has created a lot more controversy, if I understand this correctly, and I believe this was during the time that Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York. He's currently running for president, but he was mayor of New York at the time, I believe. And they were trying to create, there, there came some group along, they wanted to create a mosque, a, a mosque for, for Muslims to pray in, right at that same site. And there was just a huge... Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I obviously, it's not not all people of religion are to blame for what other people do, but obviously, it wouldn't have been a very good thing to do. No, it wasn't, and I know that there was a lot of fighting about it back and forth for years, and I'm still not completely certain of what actually happened there. But uh, as far as conspiracy is concerned, there's not a whole lot you can bring up to me that um, if I even looked into it at all, but I'm not willing to talk about. Like I say, I did do a lot of research on the Titanic, and just to let you know, my heroine from Forward to Camelot, Katie Tyler, is going to be involved in a time travel adventure where she and someone else go back to the Titanic. Cool. 
Yeah, that's extremely interesting because when I started looking into that, it just blew my mind. And I guess what I'm wondering is being where you, living where you live and being where you are, being who you are, my question is, have you ever looked into any of the stuff involved in that? It's, it's a sistership as well, the Titanic as well, isn't it? I'm sorry, which, are you talking about the Olympic or are you talking about the Britannic? Uh, uh, the, the sister ship also had the same sim- sort of similar fate that you said it wouldn't be seen. Blah 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 blah. blah. Later. Is that what you're talking? I think you're talking about that. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the yeah the sister ship with the Titanic because it had a sister ship as well. Two sister ships actually. Yeah. The part that's interesting about all of this is, did you know? This is a true story. Did you know that one of the women who was one of the what was she? Was she a waitress or something who had worked on the Titanic? Not only was on the Titanic and managed to get off safely, but she was on the Olympic, which had been in an accident, a major accident, before the Titanic ever launched. And she was on the Britannic when it went down, too. I think so. I think those ships are very unlucky. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I think there's a little bit more to the unlucky part than that. Do you want me to give you the, the, the part about that? Yeah, go on, then. What I found? Okay. Um, I started looking into this. Titanic has always fascinated me, and... Um, and this is the way that I think goes along with a lot of conspiracies. I think the people who set them in motion, the number one thing that they do not realize is that people will care. And they'll continue to care and they'll continue to dig and they'll continue to look. Um, I think this is absolutely the case with Kendi. I thought they, they thought that they could just say, oh, well, he died, and people would just go on, and they didn't do it. But I think it's the same with the Titanic, because there have been many, many, many shipwrecks over the years. And Titanic was um, was one of the worst, but it was not the worst or anything like that. So a Lusitania was probably worse than that. But anyway, um, what I started looking into is the fact that these three ships were supposed to become this major, major profit-sharing center for the White Star Line, which was the, a ship line that actually created these three ships. And the whole idea was that Bruce could say, who, uh, was the owner, or not the owner, he was the president of the White Star Line, it was actually owned by J.P. Morgan. Um, he wanted to create three enormous ships that were the last word in luxury. The whole idea was he was going to use them not only to bring wealthy passengers back and forth across the Atlantic, but also use them as immigrant ships to bring a lot of, especially Irish immigrants, from Ireland to America. And so he was very excited about doing that, and they spent an enormous amount of money to build these ships. And they built about a uh, Harlan and Wolf, which was the shipyard which still exists in Ireland, uh, in Belfast today. And the whole point is, is that they spent literally millions of dollars. And the whole idea was that they had to get these ships into profit as soon as possible. And what happened was the first one off the assembly line was the Olympic. And it went into service. And it, by the way, it looked almost identical to Titanic because it was built from the same set of plants. And the Britannic, when it was built later, was built from the same set of plants as well. So that's important. I mean, what happened was the Olympic, uh, almost six or seven months after it went into service, had a major accident was where it was rammed by a Navy destroyer. And it was, I think, hot. And it was really, really badly injured. I mean, to the point where it was practically not fit to be on the seat. And what happened was is they, it took them two weeks just to get it back to Harlan and Wolf so that they could actually start to try to pack it up. And what they found out was is it was in terrible shape, keel was bent and all kinds of terrible things, and they would have to basically rebuild it. But right after the incident with the Hawk, the Navy held an inquiry and basically decided that the Hawk was not at fault, even though probably it was at fault. And when that happened, it invalidated the insurance sorry, on the Olympic, which meant that any of the repairs that the people were going to be doing through the White Star Line were going to be repairs they had to pay for themselves. And that's very important to know. So, what happened was, they actually um, patched it up, sent it out, and at that point, then it ran over a reef. So it was in really, really bad shape. It threw a propeller, there's been all kinds of other incidents. Then what happened was, the Titanic was about ready to, to sail. And so what they did was, the decision, I believe, that was taken, and there's been some wonderful books written about this, the decision, I think, that was taken was, the ships are practically identical. Why don't we simply take the Olympic, patch her up as best as we can, send her out and act as though she's the Titanic and then let her sink and sea. And then we can collect the insurance because the Titanic was fully insured. In fact, it was overinsured, and the Olympic didn't have any insurance on it at all. It couldn't be insured. So the whole idea was 
they, uh, they set sail in April at a time when, of course, it was freezing cold in the North Atlantic. That wasn't supposed to be a problem because they had already figured out a way to make sure the passengers got off the ship of the, whatever the incident was happened. They had actually sent something, somebody out there, um, a ship called the California. They sent it out in the middle of a coal strike. And in the middle of a coal strike when other ships were still at the dock, this ship was still and sent out into the North Atlantic. It didn't have any passengers. There were seven doctors on board, which I find peculiar. And also, they had uh, a cargo of 3,000 woolen blankets and 3,000 woolen sweaters. Again, I find that just peculiar and strange. And they were headed supposedly for Boston. Anyway, they went out into the North Atlantic ahead of the Titanic, and they just sat there, basically. And then the incident happens with the iceberg or whatever it is, and there have been some uh, things that I've read that indicated that it's possible that it wasn't an iceberg, but it was basically an internal explosion. Whatever it was, the ship was crippled, it starts to sink, and the Californian, which should have come to its rescue, did not do so. And the reason for that specifically was because most likely, based on where the two ships were, they actually did not come to the rescue because they couldn't see them. And this was something that was very, very... Um, it, it was something that the um, captain of the Californian was uh, blamed for this and blamed for letting all those people die. But in fact, he didn't necessarily do anything wrong. But the Carpathia, which was around, did come to their rescue, even though it didn't get there until long after the sinking had happened and all these people had died. So they picked all the survivors up and brought them to New York and everything else. It was tragic in every possible way. Um, and there's a million other things that I can tell you about this, but the main thing really is it sounds like it was meant to be an insurance scam because less than a month after Titanic sank, the insurance companies, excuse me, the insurance companies paid out in full, which I find just plain strange. I think that something like that, they would do some sort of investigation, but they didn't. So, take it for what it's worth, but there's a lot to talk about with that particular topic. That is why Katie Tyler, my girl, is going to be going back and doing a time travel adventure. Um, that I'm actually doing another story with her now that does not involve time travel. It involves her reaction to the time travel she did with Kennedy when she comes back. And then the next time travel book is going to be, like I say, about the Titanic, and that's when she's going to hang it up and say, you know what, I don't need to do this anymore. I, mean, I think you'd, I'm looking forward to it. That's very interesting. Now... Um, well, I'm going to think, to be or not to be, there's no blue in the question of the soul, blah, blah, blah. I see you've done a little bit of a Shakespeare bit, and you've written two one-act plays, which is not the easiest thing to do. No, no, it was, um, those were a lot of fun, actually, to write. Uh, one of the plays, by the way, I wrote for my son. He was in a drama group when he was in elementary school, and they were doing a, a spring play the kids had to put on themselves and they came to me and said would you write it and I said sure so I wrote it and um, he ended up being part of it and I ended up being uh, president all the rehearsals and trying to help with blocking and directing and all this other kind of thing and we had a really great time the first one however the first one act play was one that was um, that was written years ago that I submitted to a um, a summer um, playwriting festival in Oak Park, Illinois, which is where I was living at the time, just before I got married. Um, and they said, we'd really like to do this play if you're willing to direct it. So I brought in somebody else who knew more about, you know, stage management stuff than I did. And between the two of us, we directed it. And um, it premiered and it did very well. So um, the, the first one was a play about newlyweds who end up finding out that they have nothing in common after getting married in a very big and expensive ceremony. And now they're off in Switzerland and they've had an avalanche and they're snowed in. And they're starting to learn about each other. And the um, second one is really a story about uh, a boy and a girl who are doing uh, a storytelling festival together and how the story that they tell, which is the main part of, the, of our play, um, actually ends up being different because she wants it to be told one way and he wants it to be told another way. And so that, that one we call... Um, and it was fun. 
enjoyed it very much. I know you mentioned before we to- got on to uh, the talking to the, on the show that you are doing podcasting yourself. Yes, I am. This has just started, and this is very exciting. I have a close friend here in town who uh, I've known for 15 years, and for about 10 of those 15 years, we've been saying to each other, we need to do a podcast. We really do. And she had actually done one herself of the Bible for a number of years, but we never got around to actually doing it. And finally past year, she's 2019, she said, you know, I'm ready to do that now. So we started putting it together, and we found out, as you probably found out, is that there are so many easy um, options for you now if you want to do a podcast or anything like that, that um, we call ours Talk Jam, and it just went up on Buzzsprout, and we've, it's already been accepted by uh, Stitcher and iTunes and we're working on getting it into uh, to YouTube and all kinds of other stuff. But this morning, I got an email from them. You know, it put up our first episode like yesterday. And I got an email saying, congratulations, your podcast has 10 plays. And then this afternoon, when I was getting ready to, do, to sit down and talk to you, I got one that says, oh, congratulations, it's 25 plays. So I fully expect to have 100 by the end of the day. It's, it's well, very good, exciting. Good, that's the, that's the beauty of it, see. That's how I started. I, I started in 2017, and all I use is a smartphone and an Amazon Fire tablet. I don't bother with technology. You don't have to have it. It's up to you. People say, oh, you have to have the, all the bells and whistles. Fine. I've got no problem with that. Have all the bells and whistles. But if you just want to have a nice talk, like you're having a cup of tea or coffee or having some biscuits, like, and just a gentle getting things out there, this is the best way to do it. You're absolutely right, and what's interesting is my friend actually invested, I think, in the snowball microphone, which means both of us can talk at the same time. Um, she said to me, you know what, I uh, actually recorded a lot of my old podcasts sitting in my car, so why don't I just pick you up, and we'll just go around, and we'll just talk, and then we'll just put those up there, and that's what we've been doing, and we've been having those marvelous times. It's been just great, so we're excited about that, we're excited about moving forward, but anybody wants to take a look, it's Talk Jam, and it's already up on iTunes, and it's already up on Stitcher, so, you know, keep looking for us, because we will be in all the... the well, yeah, keep, keep putting, um, go on to the podcast content um, directories, and put all your, put it out there as much as possible, put your RSS feed on, I know I can't say they have set it, but go for, do one for Spotify, and Radio Public... Um, anchors are good for free, but that's what uh, Buzzsprout is supposed to do. They're supposed to get us accepted to all the things, which is why we put our initial yeah. uh, offering up there. So yeah. we will see what happens, but I would imagine we're going to be on several different podcast lists at some point. Very soon. Good, I'm, I'm yeah. glad about that. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit because you've mentioned it that you've worked as a reporter on the Dodger Stadium. For us over here, it's called baseball. I've watched baseball once. I do not understand what the hell it's about. But then if I tried to explain cricket to you, you probably would know what the hell it's about. So, it's about equal. Well, I gotta tell you. I mean, I realize I'm slightly, slightly prejudiced. And I also realize that European football is extremely big in the UK. And all those other things. But, I will tell you that baseball is the best game that's ever been invented, ever, by anyone, anywhere. So, we'll just leave it at that. Um, that was one of the best parts of my career, is having the opportunity to work out of Dodger Stadium as a sports reporter. And what's really interesting is is that I kind of, that kind of has gone through another generation because my older son now has just graduated from Clemson University last year uh, with a degree in um, industrial engineering. I'm going to brag for just a second here, but... Before he left, he had become the sports editor for the Clemson Tiger newspaper. So what happened was, every time they had a football game or a baseball game or a basketball game, he was right there with his little blank and whatever, asking questions and writing stories and all kinds of other stuff, laying out the things for the production team and all that. And um, as a partially as a result of that, he has just gotten his first job in professional sports. He's working for the Kansas City Chiefs, the football team. Cool. Good for him. It's very, it's incredibly exciting, and I'm thrilled to death. He moved from South Carolina, where I live now, to Missouri this summer, uh, which is 1,100 miles away. We're going to be seeing him for the first time since that time uh, in 
Christmas time. We're excited about that. But the fact of the matter is the fact that he knew that I had done all this sports writing um, kind of got him interested in the topic, and he started writing pieces and sending them to me, and the next thing you know, I asked him to be the editor of the sports section, so it's very exciting. Well, I think we've covered most of what you do, uh, young Susan. Um, I'll call you young because I was born in the 60s myself, so we, we, we call ourselves, we recycled almost teenagers. Uh, um, That's where we are. Um, would you like to mention any websites or your uh, where people can find your books, blah de blah blah Yeah, absolutely. You can find my books anywhere on Amazon. And again, my name is Susan Sloat. It's S-L-O-A-T. And my website address is susansloat.com, that's S-U-S-A-N-S-L-O-A-T-E, where you will be able to find links to all of the books that I have available now and information about where I'm going to be and what I'm going to be doing, breaking news and um, upcoming events. And I uh, would love to hear from anybody who has heard this and would like to talk to me or ask a question or anything like that. I'd love to. So feel free. Be in touch. There are contact forms I would love to hear from. Right, uh, before I go, I, I know you like to do a unique sign-off for my show. Now, okay. obviously, you're multi-talented. Um, so, Susan, what would your unique sign-off be? My unique sign-off? <laughs> How about see you next time with more conspiracies, Mark? Oh, I like that. And here's my one for you. <clears throat> Take me out to Susan to see her books in the crowd. We'll buy some peanuts and crackle jack, jack which I don't know what that is, and take him back with her. And we'll sit tune, try and travel somewhere in the future, as we have done on this podcast, you see. Because I have been in UK, which is in the future, and Susan has been in the past. So we have done the subject of a book. Thank you for having me, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>